From the Toronto Star, I'm Rajiv Mudder, and this matters. How do you test a tiger for COVID-19? Very carefully. There have been lots of stories about animals in this pandemic. From many anecdotal tales about wildlife moving back into our empty urban areas, to all the people who have adopted pandemic puppies because now is the perfect time because they're stuck at home. One of the divining things about a novel coronavirus is that it is a disease that jumps from animals into humans. But what does it mean when that disease jumps back into other animals? With the news of two pet cats in New York City contracting this disease from their owners, the American Centers for Disease Control has updated their advice on dealing with pets during this pandemic. There have been reports of other animals, like a tiger in the Bronx Zoo and minks on farms in the Netherlands. Because of all that, as well as lots of speculation about bats being COVID-19 animal enemy number one, we decided that it'd be a good time to chat with an animal expert. Today, we are speaking with Scott Weiss, a veterinary internal medicine specialist and Professor and Chief of Infection Control at the University of Guelph's Ontario Veterinary College. Professor Weiss, thank you so much for joining with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I think there's a lot of questions about animals. There's been some stories about potential human-to-animal transmission, but obviously you're an expert on animal infectious diseases. And so let's just start very generally. What are you watching with COVID-19 and this virus right now? Well, we're looking at a couple aspects. I think this is a one health problem. This is something that originated in animals and then spilled over into people and now is exclusively or almost exclusively a human disease. But we need to sort out those two things because we want to make sure there's not a small animal component to worry about. A small component of a big problem still could be relevant. So we're worried about you know, two main things. One is animals getting sick from this virus, mainly from human to animal transmission. And the other is, is there a potential that animals could become reservoirs? If we infect animals, can they pass it around and maybe pass it back to us? When did you first hear about this disease and what were your first thoughts? Uh, I think we first heard about it, you know, end of December, early January, it was mentioned. And, you know, it's one of these things you look at it. We see it on ProMed Mail, which is a listserv that brings out infectious disease information. And it, and it was interesting, but I've seen various infectious disease people saying the same thing. It was interesting, but we didn't think it was going to be this because new things happen all the time. But on the other side of that, we've been expecting this. This is the third major coronavirus that's moved into people in the last 20 years. We've had SARS, we've had MERS. And one thing I talk about quite a lot when I'm talking to different groups about emerging diseases is, well, here's what SARS did. Here's what happened with people self-isolating. And, you know, we didn't really think about a lot of the aspects of that human-to-animal transmission with SARS. And we got lucky maybe that there wasn't transmission to animals and then transmission back to people. And we've maybe improved a little bit here, but I think we're still in the situation where we saw this. It was a human disease, and it was, you know, really just addressed as a human disease after it made that animal jump. And we're going on the, you know, hope there wasn't an animal issue as opposed to evidence there was an animal issue. So basically, when it first came out, it was interesting. I don't think any of us really thought it was going to be as big a deal. Once things started to ramp up in Wuhan, I think there was still a lot of thought that, okay, well, it's a big problem in one heavily populated area, but it's probably not going to cause a lot of problems. Because we know SARS, and Toronto was very severely affected by SARS, but that was one of the few cities that was severely affected, and it was a short-term problem and SARS basically disappeared. The way this has all progressed, I think, has been quite surprising to probably everyone. I think a lot of people are concerned about their pets, as there's been some stories about that. But there's been some controversy about this and the talk about wet markets as being the source of this. Generally, that sort of sounded like the accepted, what people believe was a theory. That said, now there's been some timeline stuff where some cases came earlier. What can you tell us about the science about this? And what are you thinking about the sort of wet market theory of where it began? Ultimately, this virus came from bats. I think that's fairly certain. How it came from bats is a bit unclear. Did it go directly from a bat to a person? Did it go through another animal? And a wet market is a great place for that to happen. So we don't know for sure whether the wet market was the source, although that's still suspicious. 
And basically, we know there are a lot of things that are undiscovered in animals in the wild. So if you look at emerging infectious diseases, it's thought that you know, 60, 70% of them are zoonotic, which means they come from animals. And it's been estimated there are you know, a million plus undiscovered viruses. And maybe a small percentage of them can infect us, but a small percentage of a million is still a lot. So anytime we start to bridge that gap between us and animals that we haven't encountered before, so going into wildlife areas, ecotourism, urban expansion, anything like that that brings us closer to things we don't have a lot of contact with, we create a point where we can transfer things back and forth. And a wet market is a bit of a perfect storm there because you're bringing in lots of different animal species, many from the wild, and you're mixing them with a lot of different people. So it all takes is one encounter. And when you have a lot of animals and a lot of people, you create uh, greater odds of that one encounter happening. I'm fascinated by bats. One of the first scientists that I spoke to at the beginning of this talked about how potentially using the bat's immune system to sort of maybe help with this. What is it about bats that sort of, I believe they carry a number of these viruses, but their immune system is built in such a way that it doesn't affect them the same way? One, we're sure it came from them. And two, is there a way that potentially they may be able to help us solve this? So that's a good question. Bats are, are unique in a lot of ways. They have a lot of viruses that can cause serious problems in us and not cause problems in them in most situations. And they're a great population for mixing viruses and having viruses around because they live in big groups and some of them migrate over long distances. Now, there's been some thought that their immune system doesn't react as much to, to some viruses. Maybe that's because of their behavior. Maybe it's because of the hibernation. But when we get infected, a couple of things can happen. And one of the problems that happens with a lot of infections is the way our immune system responds. And actually, the immune system does a lot of the damage. So sometimes ignoring a virus is the best thing. And it's thought that maybe that's some component of how some of these viruses survive in bats. But we really don't know. And it's not something that, you know, we could just say, okay, let's downregulate our immune system to protect us from this virus, because that's going to create a whole range of other problems. But I think understanding how this virus interacts with bats, maybe there'll be something down the road that'll figure out, if, is there something specifically we could do to people, not, you know, a big gun, knock your immune system down, but do something to make it a little more able to ignore the virus beyond our typical approaches, like vaccination, where we're trying to respond to the virus. Some of the animal stories that have been talked about right now have come from New York City. There was a tiger in the Bronx Zoo. There are two pet cats. And actually, today I read a story about two minks on a Dutch farm that have somehow tested positive. I think people are trying to be concerned about human-to-animal transmission. Can you talk a little bit about these animals and how that happened? Well, if you think of it, it's not too surprising, right? We have a lot of animals. Large percentage of the population has close contact with animals on uh, any given day. And if you look at New York, where there are a lot of people that are affected, it's not surprising to see spillover. Now, we're not seeing a lot of testing of animals, so we don't have an idea of the scope of the problem. But, you know, if you're infected with this virus, and you have a cat or a dog, or you live on a farm, you're encountering animals, we can expose those animals to the virus. Now, it depends on whether the animals are susceptible. And we know that some of our domestic animal species are susceptible. Cats can get infected. Ferrets can get infected. You mentioned mink. It was two mink farms in the Netherlands that have infections going on there. Dogs seem to be fairly resistant, although they can get infected with the virus. They just don't seem to get sick with the little information we have so far. So certainly, whenever we've got someone that's infected and they're living around other animals, that includes people and you know the non-human animals, they can expose those. And it really depends on whether that individual is susceptible. That's that whole One Health concept, right? It's not just me and my family. It's me and my family and the animals that are around us. And sometimes what happens to me can impact them and vice versa. One of the reasons I want to talk to you is the first story I read, you quoted and you said, if your pet has it, they got it from you. People get worried about things, right? This is a, a, a big problem. So people will hear about, yeah, animals can get affected by this virus because they can. And they start looking at their cat and they can, oh, this is my cat can kill me, right? And it comes down to putting it in perspective, right? So I have a dog with some cats. If they've got it, they got it from me or one of my family members because they're being socially distanced. And that's the take home, right? As we talk about social distancing, we think about people, but social distancing involves everyone in your household. So, you know, if you wouldn't go to the park and shake someone's hand or give them a hug, you probably don't want your dog going up and having them pet it or having them rub against it. So if my dog and my cat don't encounter other people outside of the household, they're not going to get exposed to this virus. They're not going to bring it into the household. So if they get infected, it's coming from people. Now, so we want to keep animals that are exposed. So if I have COVID, I don't want my animals having contact with anyone else. I want to keep them in the household. If they're infected or not, we're all going to get rid of it together. 
but I don't want my cat going out and encountering stray cats or neighborhood cats. I don't want my dog going to the vet unless we have to because those create new contact points. So we want to limit the number of contacts. That's the whole concept of social distancing. And we just need to remember that it applies to animals just like people. There's been a lot of talk about human tests, but are animal tests exactly the same? Do you shove a cotton swab up their nose? Because that's not something I'd want to do to a tiger. Yeah, with a tiger, you knock them out before you do it. So with the Bronx Zoo tigers, they anesthetize the one that was sick to get samples. And then their later testing, they used fecal samples because you can get poop a lot easier and get a nasal swab from a tiger. Our approach to the testing in animals is very similar, though. And it depends on the species, right? We can't stick a swab up a cat's nose very easily. So we try to balance getting a good sample and getting it safely for the animal and everyone. So we're doing surveillance on exposed animals and households. So what we do is if it's a dog, we get a sample from their nose, and that's fairly similar to what we do for people. They tend to like it a little bit less than we do, but we can get a swab from their nose, we get a swab from their throat, and we get a, a rectal swab too because some animals can shed in their in their feces as far as we know. So we're going to sort that out. But yeah, same general approach, same general idea of the testing. We're trying to find out if the virus is there. You mentioned big cats, you've mentioned minks. Are there any other animals that are particularly susceptible to this? I think there were some reports of a baboon in Africa as well, but I'm not sure if that's been confirmed or not. Yeah, if, if we look at the species that are closely related to us, it's not surprising they'd be susceptible. So they're not human primates. So zoos are very concerned about all their monkeys, apes, gorillas, everything like that, because they're probably a very susceptible species. And then it's kind of a mix of species. So cats are susceptible and cats can get sick. Ferrets are susceptible. They can get sick and mink are related to ferrets. So that wasn't too surprising. Dogs are lower on the susceptibility. There have been experimental studies now looking at species like um, pigs and poultry, and they haven't been susceptible, which is good. So we're starting to learn more and more about what species are susceptible and which ones are, and we're hoping that it's a fairly limited range, and we're hoping that it doesn't include species that we have very commonly out in the wild or that we have a lot of contact with. So the, the fewer species and the less distributed they are, the better for us. Obviously, this is a disease that is existed in animals, jumped to humans, now is jumping back to animals. Is there anything that we should particularly be concerned with as it sort of moves? And I mean, is the word mutate wrong? Well, we're always paying attention to, to things changing, but these types of viruses don't tend to make a lot of major changes. Like, this is a human disease. So it was an animal disease or it was an animal virus, and now it's a human disease, And we can get spillover. And we've known this for various viruses, even human influenza. So if you have influenza, just our normal run-of-the-mill human flu, you can infect your dog or your cat. It's uncommon. But, you know, you cough on them, you touch their nose, they can get infected. And they typically are what we call dead-end hosts. So they might get sick, but the virus dies off in them. They don't pass it around. It's not their flu. So we're trying to figure out, is that the situation with the animals we have here? So we can infect them. But are they then completely irrelevant? What we ultimately want to do is be able to say, okay, this is how big of a problem it is for animals. And hopefully it's a very small problem health-wise for animals. And ideally, we'd like to say is animals don't play a role in human disease at all. So even though we can infect them, they're not a big deal. Or here are the things we can do to reduce the risk of them infecting, getting infected and them being a reservoir. So what we want to do ultimately with the work we're doing with animals is keep animals safe, but mainly to keep this purely a human disease so we don't need to worry about animals. And that's why we're getting information to find out how commonly we pass it to animals. And if an animal gets infected, can they pass it on to us? Right now, we don't have any evidence that animals that are infected can pass it on to people. But we do have some evidence that cats and ferrets that are infected can pass it to another cat or ferret. So we need to figure out whether they can pass it on to us as well. Is that transmission, would it be the same as us, as a respiratory disease? Well, mainly it's going to be a respiratory disease, but that's something again we're trying to sort out. So it's mainly in respiratory secretions. We know some individuals can shed it in their feces, whether that's a risk or not. Uh, let's talk about that mink farm. Uh, the two mink farms in the Netherlands, the mink manure has to be a concern because there were 20,000 plus mink on these farms. We don't know how many were affected, but people aren't having close contact with the nasal secretions uh, on these mink, but there's going to be a lot closer contact with the manure. So, you know, your contact with your dog, it's mainly you coughing on your dog, your dog coughing on you, or are you touching when your, your hands are contaminated with the respiratory secretions. But we need to figure out some other things like handling a fecal sample, whether that's going to be a problem. 
You know, the CDC's website is one of these things that uh, the information about your pets has sort of changed over time, because initially it didn't seem like there was very much risk. Now, obviously, there's been a few animals that have caught it. What advice would you give to people with pets right now? Yeah, I, I think a lot of it's relaxed. So I think, you know, CDC's guidance has changed. In Canada, we've taken a more of a, an approach saying, yeah, we don't know. Like, I think one of the things is we have to be willing to say we don't know at the start Yes, they went from animals to people. We have no idea what other animals they can go to. We're working on it, but we're not going to say there's no risk until we have evidence that there's no risk. So I think we took a little bit different approach here. But realistically, the take home from most pet owners, for all, for all pet owners, is your, your pet poses very, very little risk to you. And if you socially distance your pet, your pet poses basically no risk to you. Like if my dog doesn't go encounter another person, he's not bringing COVID into the household. So if he gets it, he got it from me or someone in my family, and they're a bigger risk to me than he is. So from a pet owner standpoint, if we do some logical things, the risk is really low. Um, for those of us as you know, veterinarians or animals, when we see animals that are coming from households, then we've got some different risk issues. So if I'm seeing an animal that's coming from a household that has COVID, okay, that's posing some risk because we're moving that animal out of the household. But just like with people, if we've got an infected household, we want to keep everyone in there, human and animal. And in terms of the animal health side, it's probably not that big a deal overall. Dogs don't seem to get sick. Cats can get sick, but they get, you know, typical like disease. They got a cough and they feel a little bit run down. They might get some diarrhea. Certainly there might be some cats that can get more sick, maybe older cats or cats that have other health problems, but it doesn't seem like it's going to be something that comes in and causes really severe illness in a large number of animals. So I think pet owners, if we just apply some common sense and we make sure that our animals aren't getting exposed to other people, then I don't need to worry about them infecting me. And from their health standpoint, if they're not getting exposed to people with this disease, they're obviously not going to get sick. So it's just some really basic things. Wash your hands, keep your animals away from other people, and relax. What about at your school? What are you telling your students, and what are other veterinary professionals doing right now to try to keep themselves safe? Well, a lot of it is how do we do social distancing and do veterinary medicine, right? The, the risk for me as a veterinarian is much, much higher dealing with people than is with animals, but we're paying attention to it. So we can socially distance from people fairly well. So someone's going to their vet, they're probably not going into the clinic. They're probably going there, calling when they get there. Someone's going to come transfer the animal while they're wearing personal protective equipment. There'll be no direct contact and the animal's taken care of. So we're separating ourselves from owners. And then we're doing things within the clinic to reduce us from infecting each other and identifying high-risk situations. So what we want to know is, is there something that would suggest that there's COVID in the household? Because if you know we're dealing with a cat from a household with people that have COVID, then we have to go on the assumption that, yeah, there's some chance this cat is infected or maybe its hair goes contaminated if they coughed on it right before it came to the clinic. So we use some extra precautions. So we don't know what the risk is, you know, but a general practice is if we can do things that are kind of easy, safe, and effective to reduce the risk, we might as well use them even if we don't know the risk is there. It's better to be proactive. So we're just doing a variety of things. The other thing in Ontario is veterinary medicine is considered an essential service, but the direction from the province is it's urgent care only. So and it just fits with the concept. We don't want people moving around if they don't have to. So if an animal needs urgent care, if it's going to die or it's serious welfare issues or something, you know, very serious disease, we're absolutely going to see the animal. If it's something we can postpone, something we can handle by telemedicine, by having them pick up medications, things like that, we're doing that so we reduce the number of contacts. So we're in an emergency only, but if an animal needs to be treated, we have ways to take care of them. Professor Reese, I think this has been fantastic for us. I think this hopefully will be a little bit reassuring to pet owners. Is there anything that I didn't ask that you think that we should know? No, I think that covers it. I think the big thing for pet owners is just common sense, right? Um, treat your dog like you would treat your spouse or treat your kid in terms of social distancing. Like in the household, interact with them. Don't be afraid of them because you're one unit in the household. And you're all exposed together and you're all distancing together. Just make sure they're all distancing together outside. So if we keep animals away from people outside of the household, we take them away from any concerns about risk. Professor Weiss, thank you so much for your time. Great, thank you. That was Professor Scott Weiss. He is a veterinary internal medicine specialist and the chief of infection control at the University of Wells, Ontario Veterinary College. That's it for today. Thanks so much for joining us. 
This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Rajiv Budder, Adrian Chung, and Saba Etazaz. Produced and mixed by Sean Pattenden, and our director of programming is J.P. Foso. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. Thank you.